When I was six, I learned about extinction. And I could not believe that we would allow animals on this planet to go extinct. So I organized my first protest. My first protest was on Bernard Avenue. We were living in Toronto at the time. And so I got my sister, my little sister, and all our friends on the block to get all our stuffed animals, get our wagons, and make signs. And so we marched around the block with our signs that said, Save the Animals. I believed I could change the course of history when returning from Brazil with my family, we were very lucky to travel to the Amazon rainforest when I was about eight years old, and returning from that trip after seeing the burning of the Amazon rainforest, I started a club with my grade five friends called ECHO, the Environmental Children's Organization. I believed I could change the course of history when I was 12 years old and with ECHO we traveled down to the Rio Earth Summit and spoke to those heads of state. I believed in it when I attended the Kyoto Protocol Conference in 1997. I believed in it when I sat on the UN's Earth Charter Commission and when I was sat on the Secretary General's Advisory Council for the Rio Plus 10 Conference in 2002 in Johannesburg, South Africa. I believed we could change our course when I biked across Canada with friends to raise awareness about climate change and air pollution here in our country. And during those years, I've also been working hard at getting myself educated. I've had to make sure that I have evidence to back up the brainwash. I took the scientific route. I got a degree in ecology and evolutionary biology. And so I learned more about extinction. And I learned that actually right now, we are undergoing the planet's sixth mass extinction. And it, the last one was 65 million years ago. It was the Cretaceous, Cretaceous tertiary event. And the difference with this, this current extinction it is, that it is that it is caused by one species on Earth, by our species. I went back to the Amazon when I was at university but this time to work at a research station. And so I saw how much the Shingu Valley and the Kayapo people have changed over the last 12 years since I was a little, uh, a little child with my family. I just finished a Master's of Science in Ethnobotany at UVic, I finished in June. On the west, and I focused on the West Coast with the Kwakwakiwak nations, learning more about the change in relationships between humans and ecology. <coughs> I've learned through science that in the years since Rio, of course, our environment has not been saved. As someone growing up on the west coast here, I am very concerned about our oceans. And a lot of research is going on here at the University of British Columbia with respect to our fisheries, our oceans, our marine, our marine ecosystems. Dr. Daniel Pauly, right here at UBC, has found that over 90% of the large fish on the, this planet are depleted. And in 2006, Boris Worm's report modeled the collapse of entire marine ecosystems. And it came out that if we continue with the current practices we are using today to harvest fish, by 2050, we will not have any fish in the oceans. And the problem with this is not just a problem of sports fishermen who are fishing at Langara and Haida Gwaii for, for fun, but this is a problem for all of us as fish protein is the biggest source of meat for humans on this planet. And on distant places for our basic food resources than ever before, it's harder and harder to buy food that is actually produced near to where we live. And Brendan talked a bit about just some of the, some of the economics of food today and some of the costs. The average distance of food, uh, uh, the average distance that food has to travel to get from its source of production to our plate is from 1,500 to 2,500 miles. Since Rio, we've also embraced the disposable mentality, where suddenly it makes more economic sense to have disposable cups, disposable uh, chopsticks, disposable cell phones and computers, it makes more sense than ones that last. We've also experienced an incredible commodification, even of basic resources like water. We now buy our water from Coca-Cola. 
16 years ago, none of us bought bottled water. All this since that speech in 1992. The Earth Summit was supposed to be this turnaround conference. It was at a point where environmental interest was at a high, and this conference was really supposed to set the tone for environmental sustainable development in the 21st century. But all of our ecological problems have gotten worse. And the failure of our turnaround then means that today, the challenge for our generation to deal with these problems that have not gone away are far, far greater. Climate change has cost our province billions. And I think climate change in the last two years has also really broken the environment out of just being an issue simply of trees and bees and, and diversity. It's really become about social justice. We're talking about climate justice. And that was pretty obvious, pretty evident when we were dealing with Hurricane Katrina. It's pretty clear that those who will be most affected by climate change will are often are now the people who are the poorest in our societies. And yet these people are not the people who created this problem. It also has become an issue of security. In 2000 and 2005, the Pentagon released a report on the threat of climate change to homeland security. And they said that climate change may pose a bigger risk to, uh, to homeland security, bigger than terrorism, if we do not pay some attention to this. This is during uh, George Bush's reign, so it's pretty, that's pretty amazing. 2006, the Stern Review on Economics of Climate Change came out. This gave the numbers the numbers to the costs to the, of climate change to the global, global economy. And this rather conservative report found that it would be more fiscally prudent to deal with climate change now than act on it later. And since that time, I, I'm sure many of you will have noticed, I couldn't open a newspaper or a magazine without reading some headline about climate change. Green has become a word used for everything. It was an issue even during the candidates' debates during the last election, and Elizabeth May and the Green Party actually stood to, um, to, to win, to have a shot at a, to elect a few members. Our province, BC, came out with a climate action plan in February, and even a carbon tax, which was impl implemented in July. So all this momentum, and now we're in October. We're at the end of October, in the midst of all this green foliage, all of a sudden, a crisis hits the other kind of green. The green of Wall Street, the bastion of 20, 20th century economics and capitalism. And suddenly the economy is the main topic of conversation. And at first I was, I, was really, I was really depressed, actually. I was really afraid and shocked at the new language of the media. It was very capitalist, very focused on, uh, very focused on this crisis, taking precedence and the most import. And it, I was worried that this new crisis would, like in the early 90s, when we had all this momentum on sustainability, become subverted. Um, from the sustainable path we seem to be interested in heading towards. But I'm realizing that actually this crisis is an opportunity. Because suddenly light is being shone on a faulty economic system. The media is actually revisiting the origins of where our current economic system comes from. We're talking about Bretton Woods. We're talking about the creation of what we have today. And it's evolution through deregulation, through globalization, which all of our current unsustainable systems are completely linked to. This economic system has evolved in a way that has resulted in the exploitation of its own citizens as well as destroying the ecosystems that keep us and every, everything else alive. And it's amazing to see in the media, we're actually seeing people talk about the economy and using words like greed and immoral and fallible. And this is, this is a new dialogue. 